Welcome everyone to the Alum Fellows Reading Series here at the Hutchins Center at Harvard. Former Hutchins Center Fellow Romeo Oryugun is a formidable poet and essayist. His first chapbook, Burnt Men, has been followed by many has been followed by many acclaimed publications, including The Origin of Butterflies, selected by Kwame Dawes for the APBF New Generation. African Poets Chapbook Series. This was followed in turn by the Museum of Silence. Romeo is the winner of the 2017 Brunel International African Poetry Prize on his 10 poems, poems from Burn to Men. Judges pointed to his quote, hugely talented, outstanding, and urgent new voice, unquote. In 2020, he published his debut collection of poetry, Sacrament of Bodies. The second volume of poetry, Nomad, won him the 2022 Nigeria Prize for Literature. Forthcoming is his third collection, Gathering of Bastards, that will be also published by University of Nebraska. A graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, he is the recipient of numerous other honors and awards, including the Future Awards African Prize for literature and fellowships and support from the Ibidi International Writers Residency, Oregon Institute for Creative Research, and the IIE Artist Protection Fund. His poems have also appeared in Poetry, Prairie Schooner, Harvard Review, American Poetry Review, Poetry London, and many, many other journals. Romeo will be joined in conversation by the very distinguished Kwame Dawes. He is author of 36 books of poetry, fiction, criticism, and essays, including most recently Nebraska, Ryovac, and City of Bones, A Testament. Speak from here to there, co-written with Australian poet John Kinsella, appeared in 2016. He is the editor of Prairie Schooner and Chancellor's Professor of English at the University of Nebraska. He's also a faculty member in the Pacific MFA program and director of the African Poetry Book Fund and artistic director of the Calabash International Literary Festival. Dawes is a chancellor also of the Academy of American Poets. Welcome to you both. We will begin with Romeo reading. This will be followed by a conversation between him and Kwame Dawes. Then we will invite the audience to comment or ask questions. Would you please start, Romeo? Um, thank you, Krishna. Um, it's a honor to be back at the Hutchins a bit virtually. Um, and it's also a privilege to be in conversation with Kwame, who has published two collections. Who will be published? Yeah, the second collection is in October, but two collections of my poems and a chat book, and who practically has been a mentor to me um, here in America. Um, I think I'll start with reading the Register of Disappearance. Um, recently, I think I've been thinking about what it means to write poems, not just about um, home or exile, but also um, about terror itself and um, what does it even mean in itself? Um, so this is the Register of Disappearance. Um, and I'll be reading some new poems, which I'll read in, into The Garden of Bastards. I'll be coming out in October. Along the passage we have created, unseen row after row of photographs showing the Herero and the Makwa genocide, a man asked of me what mercy is given to those who sleep into dust, spilling their lives into the dark rooms of our imagination. I couldn't answer. I turned to the trays filled with small chops and wine, hiding from the glasses on his face. It has been years and still, I am searching for a way to bury these poems into a memorial of care. Along the highway that lead to rivers, tab tables covered with runes filled with dried blood, heavy with slain antelopes, offer a glimpse of terror to those who seek the battlefield of the oppressed. Every violence has its own spectator. And late at night, when birds listen to the world, when the first tendrils of new yams hunger for light, I imagine the polar bear who sleeps at the foot of a disappearing world, the man who flinches as a bullet moves towards his own death. I too have been a spectator of terror, 
drawing from the end of a city, the lyric of smoke. I have imagined from dark places, the pathway of constellations. And though I have spoken to the dead, I am still waiting for them to speak to me in this exile that I have found myself. Um, this is called a folk tale of shadows. I, I think recently, probably within the past two, three weeks, I have been trying to reimagine folk tales into this. Um, into, I think to like speak to contemporary issues, I guess. Um, so this is called the folk tale of shadows. About borders, a city official once declared that those of us who can speak the language of blood do not, do not belong to the city. The old way lives with us, and though we lie to ourselves, the earth has not progressed beyond our naked hunger to hoard and plunder. The battle for land and belonging didn't begin with Cain and Abel. It began in the rainforest, in a palace where a king, jealous of the freedom that lived in the bones of little boys, gave one of the boys a basket and challenged him to fill it with water gotten from a faraway river. The world has always been cunning. And before the boy left, he drew his shadow on sand and asked the king to watch over it. Of course, it rained and the shadow was washed away. The boy returned to the king to show the king his foolishness and was made king instead. There is no story that truly ends. There is no joy that does not end. And it has been so since the world learned how to survive. And just like every migrant, the boy spent his life wondering if he belonged to the throne of tall trees. The ancient ones knew so much about fate. They gave the boy a new name, a belonging that deepened his name into the roots of trees. About that we have failed. And though the sky darkened, and though the river rushed a new name through us, we did not hear the voice of the divine. Shut out from the promise of home, we have created our own path, dragging the wreck of this world behind us. Okay. Um, and the next one I'll be reading is called, It Begins With Love. In the fishing village, a man whispers, let nobody bloated and gone find its way to my boat. He gives thanks to the wild, to the ants running from his sandals, to the vultures standing over the road kill. Romeo, the day begins with love, I tell you. After a long night, after the rain, after the sleep of hibiscus, the world opens its hands to sunlight. There is time for everything, for the child down the street struggling with his clarinet, for the liberal kissing his wife's belly, for the newborn seeing color. It begins with love, I tell you, even prayers. And I have stood in the middle of a field, amid the gaze of antelopes. I have prayed for thunder, a rod on my head. I, who lived for 10 months without a friend, whose sole fear is the world so full of love, so full of loneliness. I have panicked, wondering if to hold a drowned body is to hold a part of myself. And from across the open field, we hear it, a fisherman's rescue call, another body washed out the river. We run toward it. It begins with love, I tell you, even burial, the hand covered with sand, a crown of seaweed. I walk to him, a song leaves me. O me, spare us in death, spare us in life. In the strangeness of villages, I suffer. What else is there to do? Um, okay, I think I have about eight minutes. Um, so I'll be reading Someday the Desert Would Sing, and it's, it's written after Tadek Badiola's um, poem, and Tadek Badiola is a poet from Nigeria. On the day of the equinox, the camels walk slowly, neither responding to the voice of their headers or to the dunes slowly shifting through an endless arena of sand. In the Sahara, where water is an old tale and the herders and animals are one, united in life as well as in an ongoing battle toward death. There is a beginning in every grain of sand. There is an origin in the night wind and the caves with their many moments of history hold all that we need to speak from. 
Of death they have seen its skeleton, they have heard its endless echo. Of life they have seen the nighttime dew, the shepherd's garment, the dog lying on the tie of a lost stranger, the plants finding strength in darkness. What speaks in the wind is the endless march of migrants, the Bendoins and their singing moon, the Nubian Ibex stubbornness, all tracks of Arab traders bridging West Africa and the Mediterranean through bags of salt, then jihad, then the movement of slaves. Through all of these, the sands kept vigil, harboring blood and bones, harboring the beauty of the rising sun between seven dunes. A Baba Ahmed in Bamako once said, when the Rebab sing, its strings belong to the desert. It tells the story of fallen stars, of the sand. Listen, he said, just before the song of the Rebab becomes the voice of God, you will hear the sound of trickling sand, the history of movement, which is the history of life and then death. Someday, when you belong to the sand, you will know the desert voyage toward the sea, its calligraphy of the world, its return to a cave, where a shepherd sings of the city, all your buildings pale before sun rays moving away from the desert. All your beauty is silent, waiting for the desert to speak even the secrets of water. Mm. Okay. I'll be reading the um, next poem, and it's called The Gallery at the End of Time. Um, and it's written after Ben Emmerwood's paintings um, called Tutu, which was once lost for, I think, 20 years and then found and, and sold. Um, the Gallery at the End of Time. It is pointless now. The old masters are gone. Their works stored in the attic, labored carefully after the years of their brilliance. And though I have tried to map the places they walk through, Venice, Oweri, Botticelli's Florence, and even the settlement in the desert where the composing bodies of shepherd wrapped in cotton, old corals, bones of dead camels and cow horns have continued to sculpt out of the earth a lesson in the abstract nature of life. I have failed to witness the acrylic heaven, the bounty of colors, the gradual unveiling of Mabu. Tethered by my chain to words, I have walked and stood in front of every painting, every sculpture, taking lessons in symmetry, expecting to see through canvas an old man sitting before the sign, drawing with charcoal the last evening of a dying master. In the middle of beauty, imagination has filled me. I have stood before Ben Elmo's long lost tutu, the sharp gaze of her eyes, her blue blouse like the evening sky, and then under her chin, a subtle burst of light. Where does it lead? When last did it light her face? There are disappearances that are curated to hold us in wonder. There are beautiful moments so powerful they give grace unto darkness, like these paintings, like my mother. The gallery has been emptied, each work of art taken away, each of them saying before entering their crates, I have spent my time under the sun, so another may take my place. And beside me, an art critic wrote down these words. We may never see the likes of these again, the gradual flirting with light, the gradients, oh beauty, oh beauty. I have not studied the history of all art, but having witnessed the stampede of those who seek the peace that comes out of holiness, I knew that perfection leads to chaos, that love holds in its palm the balm of death and eternity. And as I walked the night, knowing that out of the darkness of time, a new school of old masters were getting ready to new the light again. I knew the lens of the world was upon me. I smiled, waiting for my end, for the light of the world to descend upon a poet writing in a small room in St. Louis reciting the poems of Haji Gura Haji, O poet of reed and sea songs, I have been traveling toward you, bringing to your old city the darkness that I have become. Um, and I think I'll just read two poems so I can still, I can still 
within time. I don't worry, please do read. Okay. <laughs> um, and so this are like from the manuscript that'll be coming out in October. Um, welcome. And before the dusk brought the boat home, and before the fisherman pronounced his great regret upon sands of Prokobite, I was alone, far from beach goers, far from Rastafari, far from the music of salvation. Before my toes, little animals burrowed into sand. I too have traveled around the world, boarding houses of cities, fountains of strangers, the deep eyes of roads have known my sleep. Before me, the sea, wide and a stranger, held my test. The rope tied to a palm tree held back the nameless boat on sea, saying to those on board, you will not flounder into the world of strangers. And before dusk, the rope tug, announcing the fisherman's desire for home. It was time to hold the tire bins of water, to press trinkets around ankles of women carrying home, to press the fisherman's longing for sand. I joined the long line of people pulling the boat to shore. The sea knew our strength. It teased and let go. What weakness we knew was a surrender to waves and the boat rode on them. What returned was not complete. What we held was only hope. Tomorrow we'll go out. The sea awaited boat, for neither grief nor pity holds back the desire of water, and the fisherman knew. And we sat side by side in the makeshift store, waiting for gin. And before us, the sea continued, fast paced and ever moving. Um, so the next mile out of the reading was a poem published by Transition, and it's, it's called The World Demands From Us Our Existence. So much of terror depends on movement. So much of terror depends on movement. I walked through the cold across the bridge where I visited the woman who always called me faggot after sex, where I sat alone not knowing why I was there, not knowing anything. Still, I love this life. Our broken road, the lone bed perched on a lamp, the river and its mystery, the earth with its village of buried bones, all those who cried before leaving this life. I know I'll cry when it's my turn, and all the sonatas of the world will rise in me. The bed is gone, the boat too, the river is empty, yet mercy leaves in its currents, it moves towards other cities. So much is asked of us, I do not know why. I do not know how to choose myself, but the birds do. I would like to join them. I have no need for speech. I want my existence to be a long song. A bird who after taking to air discovers heaven is emptiness and does not lament. Having known that there is no home apart from terror, I lend my voice to our survivor. I demand a wild life. Um, do I still have time? <laughs> Would you like to read some more? Great. Maybe two. <laughs> oh, please do, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, what I'm going to read is called um, Assimilation. This is my 40 year I word. I thought I was going to spend two. So, uh, this is one of the many Iowa poems I've ended up writing here. Assimilation. It was not the green of trees that welcomed me to spring. It was not the resurrection of dead fields that showed me that the way through life could be green and tender. It was a little dog, a terrier mix, running around the park, yelping into the naughtiness of air, daring even God to stop her. I stood for minutes outside the fence, watching her, wondering about my life. In the Midwest of America, I have become domesticated against the beauty of rainforest. Everything has slowed down. 
The antelopes in my dreams have stopped gliding over fallen logs. Instead, they are strolling through the grasses, kept out of the wild by a row of wooden fences, like I have been kept out of my country. As the end of my life, the slowness of wonder, I have forgotten the colony of bees. I have forgotten the wild goat chasing me on broken bridges as I ran to drink sugar-filled coffee in roadside kiosks. It is a tin of terror to stare into the light of your past, to fall to the ground, a broken being, trying to root his, beginning, his belonging into the depth of a new world, becoming like a little dog waiting for its first rain, staring at the clouds with no knowledge of what it feels like to surrender fear to the solitude of rainfall. Um, and I think I would end with one of the very first poems I ever, I ever wrote, and it's called Remembrance. Um, and it's actually the oldest poem in all my collections. It escaped being published in Sacrament of Bodies and escaped being published in Nomad. And finally, um, I have found a space for it in, in, the, in the collection coming up in October. Um, and, and it's written after the Asaba massacre um, that happened during the Nigerian Civil War. Remembrance. I won't tell the world to slow down. Instead, I would say, come into my house, sit, drink milk, and listen. I ran out, I returned, and it was still the same picture on my wall, still the same story spinning in the waters of Asaba, the year running back to 1967, when men clad in white were killed like sacrificial doves while their mouth chanted one Nigeria. Years after their death, I watched a man look into my eyes without regret as he recounted the moment the land covered its ears as bullets reduced sons to silence. My mother said, some men don't feel the pain of a dog passing away. I tried to tell her that that's what they were called as they marched them to death. But she said, don't remember those things. Everyone has moved on. Everyone has forgotten the sound of men crying into the heart of God. So I ran to build a wall around my ears, but their screams kept tearing it down. I ran to take their names, the names of all who died in the hands of a man that resembled a friend. I listed them and it was so long. I called, no one answered. I walked into a house and it was empty, the door unhinged. On the walls were history, writings of cobwebs, and beside old documents, a mother buried her wrinkled face into an old paper as she searched for the name of her son. I turned from her and God failed. So, um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was honest. Um, Kwame Das, would, would you like to engage from your in conversation? Yeah. Um, Romeo, thanks for that beautiful reading. Um, <laughs> I spend a lot of time in your work, so I, it's it's great to be able to just ask you questions. I mean, normally, normally I'm talking about line endings and <laughs> and um, um, word choice and so on. But what I don't tell you enough is just how. Um, how powerful your work is, how urgent it seems. So, so one of the things I thought might be useful to me anyway, and I, I hope for everybody else is, is, you know, running through your work is this, this movement, you know, there's this constant sense of exile, travel, movement, place to place. I know a little bit about your biography and I know that you have moved um, from place to place. And there's this, this wonderfully complex relationship, which I think is almost a necessity for poets with home, with the idea of home. So I'm asking you a basic question. Can you just like tell us your movements, like <laughs> some of the, the stuff you've made in, let's say in the last five years, because I think, I think it helps to understand that. And then it takes us to other questions that I would have for you. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think even before the, the last five years, I've never really stayed. The longest I've stayed in a place is in Iowa for four years. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't write from when I was a child. We we're always moving. My dad was a civil servant. And when he right. died and I went to stay with my mom, I stayed in Bini for a while and then um, went to school. And, and I, I don't think I've ever stayed in a place for more than two years. Um, and then in, within the last five years, I moved from Nigeria to Ghana and then did a road trip because I was I was almost bored out of my mind in Accra. It's as if Accra was not a great place to Come be. On. Come on, man. <laughs> It's a, I, I consider Accra to be one of those that spiritual thriving places. metropolis. I think I consider Accra to be home That's for me. All right. That's um, all right. but it was it was not out of choice. It was one of yes. those places that were supposed to be stopped and for a few months, and I ended, I ended up staying there for a year and. Yeah. I didn't know anybody. I think I had to cry to you, like, hey, Kwame, can you introduce me to someone? I know, I remember that. <laughs> I didn't know anybody there. It was just me. Uh, and one can only read books so much before it feels as if the walls are closing in on you. Um, and so I did a road trip um, to um, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Mali, um, to the outskirts of Dakar, um, of Senegal, and, and back. Um, and, I, and I think, yeah, and I think those are the, the movements I've made. And then to the U.S. from yeah. um, Cambridge to Portland to Iowa City, and then to Ames. So yeah, yeah. yeah so so I'm interested in in that idea. Some some of your movements have been forced. Some have been just by the the nature of um, a, a life, the the circumstances of life. Um, when you think of home, you know, there's a, there's a, I remember I heard somebody, a woman talk about, you know, trying to define home. And she says, her statement was that home is where you want to be buried, which, 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 which seems like a relatively innocuous statement, but it made sense to her in a very interesting and complex way. I, I wonder if you could, you could think about that and talk a little bit about it what what home is starting to mean what home has been um and 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 how that how that i think your work is about home uh various ways in dealing with home but i would love you to talk a little bit about this yeah i don't i think home for me was just being with my mom um uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was not really about a space or whatever mm -hmm. it was those very few moments i i got to spend with my mom before she died um and I think apart from that, I was talking to um, Sadiq, um, yeah. Sadiq Bogi. We've been going back and forth with the elections that just happened in Nigeria and right. um, the divide that it seems to, that, that has always been there, but that every four years are so very alive in our faces. Um, and I was like, I never felt Nigerian until I left Nigeria. And um and living in Nigeria doesn't even it doesn't feel as if I'm Nigerian or like the identity of what it means to be Nigerian it's not something I hold so there I think home for me is just um it changes every single time mm -hmm. I guess and I think in my work it's something that reflects I think home once upon a time was just a place where um I could be free to be myself right coming to the U.S. and realizing that the idea of freedom is also a myth because the U.S. is gradually turning um, in terms of like queer laws and and um, against queer people. It's been it's been turning turning very draconian lately, and um, it's like oh, where, where's this freedom that I keep seeking for? So I, I I think for me, I just I don't know. It's it's really an interesting thing that I keep thinking. I think every poem I write thinks and rethinks about that idea of what um, of what home is both emotionally and physically as well. I think that's one of the things that comes through. But there's also another element in a statement. I, I, I think you tweeted it or something, but it, 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 it stayed with me in a weird way, which nothing in Twitter stays with me. Um, but somehow something, you were reflecting on something and you said something about the need to care, to care for the ancestors. You, 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 you know, typically we'll say to care about, uh, to care, 
but the the a kind of there was a kind of tenderness in your idea of caring for the ancestors. Um, and I wonder if you could I wonder if you could talk a little more about that idea. You know that idea of the relationship between the living, the dead, the past, and the future. And of course, the idea of ancestry and ancestors, which in the West African context is something quite specific, um, despite its universal application and so on and so forth. So um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think it was during all of those times that people were arguing about what energy, energy right. meant. Right. And poetry. And yeah. Right. Um, I think for me, there's, there's always been this very, um, this belief that the dead are always around us in a very real way, that, that they partake of this world. Um, I remember when I was a very young boy, one of the very um, few moments of tenderness that I saw um, my dad partake in was actually going to his parents' graves um, to like, kill chicken and then allow the blood to flow into the ground. Um, and he was singing songs and my dad was not a tender man. Um, mm -hmm. So there was that feeling I got right from there that there was something so powerful mm -hmm. about that um, about that meeting place between the dead and the living, especially when there are people who you care for. Um, and having lost my parents at a very young age, mm -hmm. um, I remember being in school because my mom was my best friend. And so she showed up in my work a lot also. Yeah. Um, I remember being in school and anything that happens out always in my head, it always goes, oh, once I get home, I'm going to talk to mom about this. And then I realized, oh, okay, she's no longer here. But there's always that very, um, that presence that I always feel. Um, and so when I was thinking about allergy, um, I don't think about allergies as a, as a place in which we mourn. I don't. I don't see it that way. I right. think there's, it's a place for conversation between the living and the dead. It's also a place in which we celebrate passage, but also um, recognize where we are at the moment as human beings. Um, I think so, struggle with the pandemic that so much of, of the death happening, we tend to lose what it really means, not just to be alive, but that space itself. Um, and so in a way I'm always returning back to that space because um, um, one of the very powerful books I've, I've read in recent times was um, um, In the Way, Christina Sharp, when she was talking about the um, the dead in the sea and which keeps getting added to. And and then in a way it's it's when, because in Benin we also have this idea in which, um, so when I was young, they'd be like, don't go to the river so you don't get drowned. But if you get drowned, uh, you get buried by the riverside. And it's believed that the, the soul or the person is under the water serving um, the deity of that river because every river has their own deity. So in a way, you're still very alive. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's just it's very different ways in which belief um, meets. And I think sometimes we also believe those things because um, we keep seeking purpose. I, I keep seeking purpose outside of what's, the different religions that have been handed down to me. Yeah, but I, I'll say this though. Okay, so so you just made a bunch of interesting statements, and you say them with the with just the ease of how you move. The, the idea of death and the dead not being static. The idea of the poem as a way to converse with an unstatic sort of other side of the veil. Um, there is a sense in which. I have to say this, and I think you must notice this, as a poet coming out of Nigeria, coming out of Africa, I, I, I think at a really remarkable time in terms of what is happening with writing and poetry there. But it seems to me that you are writing, you, you, there's no shortage of stuff to write. Like they, you, you cannot, because of, it's almost like there's this, this water hose and you're trying to drink through this massive water hose and there's just so much water coming out and you're generating these poems. That's how I imagine it. But I don't know what's happening in your life and how you make your poems, but I would love you to talk a little bit about the urgency of making poetry now because you are very generative and you're creating this really exciting and dynamic work that is crossing 
cultures that is also returning to cultures. In one voice, you speak of village, and it's not, it's not an it's a word that is living, it's present. The village is not a, a kind of archaic idea. The village is a very real thing um, and a tangible, present, modern thing. Um, so all of that I, I see happening with your work, which makes it exciting. But do you realize this? <laughs> this is my question. I, um, I, I, I think like one of the best things that have happened that happened in my life was um, always returning to the village during during the holidays. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, um, being in city with our own history, um, both colonial, but also a very powerful pre-colonial um, presence. Um, and being with my grandma and, and watching her wake up in the morning to come in with her own ancestors before even going to the farm. Right. Also coming back home and seeing my uncles listen to like radios and debate football matches that happen halfway ac across the world. Um, there's a way in which that space almost becomes very cosmopolitan in the way it reacts to things. Right. It's totally cut off in the way people think about villages when they think about African villages as something very um something very archaic and something that's that's like the idea of the, the suffering African. Yeah. And I, and I think growing up in that space gave me that idea of there's something very powerful here. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like writing, um, I was very aware when I started writing that there were so much stories that were missing from Nigerian poetry in particular. Yeah. yeah. I was also very aware that people were thinking about the political as this means of activism rather than the, the best idea of politics in a poem is the little stories in which we write about people and ourselves and about spaces in which we inhabit and allow those stories to, to come into their own power and say what they want to say. Um, and when I started thinking that way, I started realizing that there's actually no shortage of things that, uh, and it's almost blasphemous to say, but in a in Nigerian culture, our literary culture that has produced so much, there's still there's still so much that's also yeah. missing. Yeah. Um, and that someone can start writing about what it means to be Nigerian in its different forms. So you have our own ethnicity, and then the village you belong to, and then the city, and then the country itself, and then what it means to also be Pan African, to also engage in conversations with different cities and cultures and writers. And, and, it, and then you just have this endless, almost endless um, possibilities of, of poems that can just happen on the page. And the problem becomes um, how to write them. Mm. Instead of, it's not really, there's no, there's no shortage of stories, just oh, how, right. it's yeah. like how to write them. And I, and I think it's, 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 also, it's also the fallout of a very, um, the detectorship. Poetry were really, a lot of the poets then were really concerned about freedom and nationalistic yearnings and, and all of that stuff, which um, was very important at that time. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I've, I keep finding in a lot of poetry is that I read around the world, which is at a, at a particular time when poets are concerned about one particular subject, every other stories take a backdrop and suffer. Right. Yeah, and so it's it's yeah, it's something I keep thinking about um, and keep um, talking about. I remember I, I remember talking to um, a Nigerian poet, and, I'm, and and I was like, you know, you can just take the photographs of the Civil War and just write an entire collection just out of the photographs alone. That's right. Yeah, and it makes me think of, um, and I'm going to just do one more question because I suspect people will have questions. I have a ton of questions for you, but I want you to think talk a little bit. Um, first of all, that poem, that, that, that Biafran poem, that war poem, um, is, is it, that, that idea of silencing the, 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 the screams um, and then the, the, the metaphor of the, the walls that are protective being broken down. I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. Um, we talk about terror, you talk about haunting, and I think those seem to be um, guiding factors. I, I, I can, I want to do that, but I really want you to talk a bit about the other element that I found very fascinating, especially in this reading, is the sea um, and how you write about the sea. 
which reminds me of influences that I think mean something to you. People like Walcott talking about the sea's history. Um, there is there is in your work an engagement with a, a sort of wider reading, even as you clearly locate yourself within West Africa, within Nigeria, and so on. So, can you talk to me and talk to us a little bit about? this idea of what is driving your poetics and your aesthetics and how are you dialoguing with other writers that you're reading and going back and forth? I'm very interested in you saying a few words about that. Yeah, one of the most fascinating thing that happened to me by coming to the US was just falling into a sea of books. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was something I didn't have in, uh, in Nigeria because I think, um, so. I didn't really like did English in college or anything. So a right. lot um, of the poems that I encountered were actually this the old um Whitman, Woodsworth, and, <laughs> That's and, right. and, and all those and all those poets. And yeah. um, and there was something about just just coming here and, and discovering so much poetry. Um and I think um, something I keep thinking about is, is how the Black poets across the world speak to each other. In what language do we speak to each other? And, and I think that one of those languages is actually the language of the sea or the language of water itself. Um, yes. It's present in Lucy Clifton's work. Um, sometimes even um, Langston Hughes, you, you, you hear the jazz, but even on the, the, the jazz operates almost aware that someone is like shaking a bottle of water. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost the same in, in Walcott's work. And, and, I, and I think recently, probably due to the movement um, of, of not just the exilic condition of Adam Zagajewski's life, but also right. um, the way in which his work encounters art, um, theory, and, um, you know, and, and seems to like speak to this idea that wherever you go, there's always beauty and you just have to open the ugliness to, to like find it. And like, so those are like the poets I keep I keep reading, but I, I, would, I would confess I have a very close affinity for Walcott. I, I think it has to do with the way, um, I think like he's the closest poet I have read who um, have, have the language I grew up with. It's almost, it's when I when I read his poems, um, even the metaphors, like the egret, for example, mm -hmm. that signifies an ending of one's life, um, it's almost as if I'm back home and I'm, I'm with my grandma and mom and, and we're talking about signifiers, ritual signifiers, um, and, and what signifies endings and all that stuff. And and I think um there's also his that great ability to capture the sound of a stranger, which is something I, I think most poets find very difficult. It's how do you write someone's voice into the poem and doesn't sacrifice and, and don't sacrifice the rhythm of the language itself. Um, and, and Walcott does it very powerful. And, and as someone who I think in recent time, most of my poems have been um, an attempt to reinterpret the external world before thinking about the internal. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I'm writing about people's voices. It's one of the things I keep returning back to is how do you write um, the voice of people you know, but also the voices of people you meet on the street. Um, and by being true to their voice, one one is also being true to their own story too. So how yeah. do I bring that in poem? And Walcott is someone I might go to. I think I also just read very wildly. It's it's the beautiful thing about reading poetry. It doesn't it doesn't end. Uh, recently, I've been reading. Um, uh, so I had a problem, not really a problem, it was a challenge with, with a student who, uh, he was a very, he was a Christian, uh, he was actually a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, writing or poetry itself tends to attract a lot of liberal minds. <laughs> and he was having so much difficulty. And, and I was like, oh, I've heard about Adelia Prado. And I said, reading her poems and seeing how one can write religion in this very contemporary way that doesn't sound um, like kids or you know, mm -hmm. romantics. And yeah, it's something I keep, um, it's something I keep going to, like just search for poets world outside of America, because I've read a lot of American poets in the past three years. So I'm thinking of um, people who are doing 
I'll speak into what I'm trying to do outside of, of the yeah. space. I'll tell you this, and uh, you know, after this, we can we can hear some questions from people. But I'll say this: that I think even Walcott would look at your work and and be grateful for it. And I'll explain what I mean. We writers are are part of the great beauty of Walcott's work is the ability to articulate the absences, the silences that haunt and that create these spaces, and a truth to that. Um, your work about your mother's voice, your mother's presence, your exploration of past ancestry, but your, also your exploration of, of sort of alienation and all of that has generated this thing that is beautiful. Um, and, you know, there's a line that you read today, which says um, it, it, it affirms that, that, but, that but, but I want to live, you know, the, the affirm, affirmation of I like life. That 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 energy, I think, is, it, and it's not facile. It is not. Um, it's not absent of incredible difficulty, um, and I think that's part of the the beauty and the energy that that your work continues to generate. So, um, I mean, keep it up. I think it's been fantastic. Um, I don't know if there are any questions that are coming through. I think we we have about ten minutes or so, as far as I know. Yeah, <laughs> that we can. <laughs> yeah. And there's a question from Trefina. We know Trefina. <laughs> we know. <laughs> yeah. Um, would you like to speak, Trefina? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just doing the applause emoji. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, no problem. That was not a raise hand. My apologies. Yeah. So while people kind of absorb um, the discussion and the reading, um, I could ask a quick question and then Ni nee has a question. Um, Romeo, how do you write? I read somewhere that, you know, you'll write something for 10 minutes and that edited and that's it. Is that true? <laughs> Oh, uh, it's still true, but the editing has changed. Um, I, I didn't walk in with Kwame, who asked me questions about every single thing I write <laughs> and challenges, um, challenges me to keep uh, asking this question about beauty and the effects that it's doing. So most times I, I tend to get carried away a lot and so now I go back to my point to look at places in which I've allowed my voice to just keep running and and like rein it in um yeah but I still I, I still write in 10-15 minutes and yeah, I don't know I just um I don't know I once I once I leave a poem and I you know Kwame has always said is going to lose me to, to fiction one day. And I don't know how that's possible because I, once I leave something after 10, 15 minutes, I, I rarely go back to complete it. I don't, I don't know how to, probably in the future, once, once life gets more difficult, so complicated as it, as it always does, I would, I would see how I can adapt to that. Thank you. Um, me, would you like to speak? Hello, Romeo. Hi, Lee. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Um, it's wonderful to hear the work. Um, obviously, like Kwame, I'm going to comment on your retreat from Accra. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, very rude, sir. <laughs> I was suspecting that. I was suspecting <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's not in any kind of um, aggressive way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not judging you. Um, I'm interested in the, the kind of pilgrimage that you made when you decided to leave Accra and what um, nuances you picked up as you crossed these borders, which are imposed, but they also lie on sways of land which, where we bleed into each other. So how those influences of the lines that were drawn and the cultures that were then imposed that kind of 
dance with the local cultures, how you felt those nuances as you moved and how that may have shaped or reflects in your work after that. Um, and I mean, so just hold on to that. <laughs> and then I'm coming to another thing which is related um, because one of the qualities that I find in your work is this humility of um, making these observations and stepping back and saying, I don't know which is a, a recurrent theme in your work. So you, you make these wonderful observations and, and then you kind of leave us with a kind of, well, I don't really know. And I don't know if this is also because of movement where you, know, you feel like maybe you can't be an authority on something because you've passed through, but it's beautiful because it gives us a way into the work. Um, and I love it, but I would like you to say a little bit about it, if you've noticed it even. Yeah. I think I do. Um, I, I think some. I think what it means to be a witness is to witness the little you can when you don't know the full story. Um, and so, when, for example, I don't. I don't really know Accra. I lived in Accra for one year. Um, I know Labadi. Um, I know Sue. I know. I lived in Kotobabi. You know and. Um, and anyway, I don't really also know those places because I, I, I think um, the, that cities or places show themselves to strangers in a certain kind of way and then show themselves to people who call their home in also a different kind of way. Um, and so I'm always aware of that. Um, I think I'm also aware of the fact that um, human beings are, are very messy and nuanced. And so I'm always thinking about that when, when writing is the person I'm meeting right now, is this who the person is or it's just this, the circumstance that I'm, I'm, I'm meeting the person. Um, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of the poets I truly love um, um, do that. Um, even what's his name? Um, Kofi Awono, a lot of his poems that he wrote outside of Ghana um, through, I think the Caribbean, I think Cuba. Um, does that also a lot in which he comments on, on what he sees, but never passes judgment. Um, and I, I think in that way, I'm always, um, I'm always thinking about Chris Abani's, um one of his um, talk in, in which he talks about that. I think to just paraphrase that um, it's the great deeds really don't change much. It's the little things that you can do. And so I'm, I'm thinking about the little sites in which you see people and see places. And what does that mean for the poem? Um, in terms of traveling, it was a very, it was a very crazy experience. Um, it, it's because uh, I remember crossing from Burkina Faso to into Mali and being detained for almost one day where and the border officials are just like, hey, you're Nigerian, you have money. You people have so much money. So <laughs> uh, and all of that. And, and knowing, and it's so funny because I, I wasn't even angry, which which was very unlike me. But I was, it was that fact that, oh, there's really, you know, you, you see this, thing. it's different traveling from Nigeria to Ghana, as long as we, we do the diasporic wars and jell wars and, and all those different mm -hmm. wars we fight. There's also this kind of like very closeness that exists when you're traveling through those borders that a, a border official, while seniors in Nigeria and also understands what it means to move. Um, and then once you leave Ghana and you move, either going to Cote d'Ivoire or Burkina Faso, those interactions changes um, and you start adapting to it. The language also changes also. Um, I discovered a Francophone Africa, like the most freest, uh, outside of Dede and Togo, like the most freest people ever that I've seen. Um, as someone can ride a taxi and, and, and smoke a cigarette and no one says anything, I don't think that will happen in Lagos, <laughs> as, as rowdy as Lagos is. But it's just seeing the different ways in which people live. Um, and I think something that sticks to me in terms of poetics, it, it's the music. Um, like when you're in Nigeria, you just Afro beats and um, you know indigenous our, our indigenous music, Fuji and, and all that stuff. And, and then you you leave, and I think that's something I appreciated once I left. It's like oh, there's something outside here, um, something we've been listening to in this very minute way, but that's very very rich. And that bleeds into into the poetry. Um, I think it also changed the way I write poems because there's a um, 
I started thinking about what it means to be a griot um, in terms of how how poetry relates itself with music um, and how, for example, the Kora, it's like this very rich instrument that holds so much history and so much story within, within it and how it bleeds into language once you start interpreting it. Um, and I think yeah, in terms of in terms of poetics, that's something I that's something I really um, started paying attention to. And I love I love Accra. I, well, I hope the Ghanaians don't crucify me. I actually love Accra. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's crucifying you. <laughs> you're, you're fine. <laughs> I feel like laughing at me. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Hi, Antoine Hi, hi everyone. Hi, um, thank you so much for your reading. Uh, it was a wonderful moment, and uh, and through your reading, I was, um, um, yeah. I mean, it, sorry. In French, we say bercé. It's like I think it's cradle. It's like the water, basically. You, I was on the ocean and, and listening to your voice as well. So uh, thank you so much for the for this moment. Um, it's it's a question a little bit related to uh, what you ask uh, um, uh, Krishna Kali. Uh, it's about ritual. Um, so, do you have a, a certain ritual before you write, and as well, um, do you have a, a ritual to um, to relax after your writing? No, the writing just happens and it's done, and I move on with the next thing in life. <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, it just, I think I just think about something and I wonder what it is. Um, and I try to answer it through a poem and I try to answer it as, as, as much as I can, which in a way I'm not realizing leads to more questions because I'm doubting myself. And then I move away from the poem and I go to the next thing that's calling me, which mostly might just be listening to music. Maybe that's a ritual of relaxation, I guess. Um, well, listening to music, or just doing, I just went about my normal day. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I think the good thing is like my laptop is always around me these days. So once I think about something, I can just open and write, but I don't, I don't, I don't. I, I, can I say something really quickly though? I think you have to work on, the narrative that you tell about writing, because right now you're being too honest. Um, you, you have to <laughs> this is something you're going to learn that you have to tell how difficult it is, how you struggle, how many revisions you do. You need to build that area of it because you're not doing a good job right now in answering that question. Otherwise, you know, otherwise people would think. <laughs> You just, I'm just joking, but it's true. The pressure to explain how we make things forces us into narratives that that are not quite accurate about the process because we don't know <laughs> the making of it and what goes into. It. So, 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 uh, you know, Romeo says, you know, if I if I write in in ten minutes and it's not done, it, it sounds like wow, but that poem, that thing in ten minutes has been in his head in some confused state yeah. for years. Do, 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 do you understand what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> the creative process is very, very hard to sort of, and unless you're doing the useful necessary job that responsible poets do, which is to remind people of how hard our job is as poets, which you're failing at right now, Romeo, just letting you know that. <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I'll walk on that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the question, Pierre. Uh, I would have to work on the, the narration of what it means to write a poem. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Adjuchoki, I'm sure I pronounced it incorrectly. Feels very close, Adjuchoki. Um, first, I'll, I'll read my, my, question, my question. I didn't want to forget it, so I typed it, and then I'll elaborate. Uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you, Kwame. Good to see you for, and thanks for public, thanks for publishing my my work with uh, African Poetry Book Fund, you and Chris Abani many years ago. Very very close to my heart. Uh, lovely to meet you, Romeo, and congratulations. Stay strong, um, and stay open hearted in your position. I was curious to know how. Um, 
you know, being in a position of privilege now and relatively safer in the US, uh, being openly queer, how you reach people in Nigeria who are queer and um, lack infrastructure, lack um, societal structures that, you know, outside of a few organizations that support LGBTQ causes um, are looking for avenues for voice and platform for speaking out. You know, I think you and I may have a few um, mutual colleagues, you know, Sheikh Ateka and Matthew Blaze, I'm sure you already know of Tears and Wear Initiative, um, but they're very few and far in between. And a lot of queer folks in Nigeria do um, look to us for support, uh, those who are in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just curious to know what avenues you have employed, because I'm always looking for that in my practice as well, um, looking for more and more ways to reach those who are in Nigeria who uh, feel voiceless within their spheres. Yeah, I, I think there's something. Yeah, I, I think there's something I was very careful about when I left Nigeria, which is what does, what does voiceless actually really mean? Because people are speaking and they're talking. Um, and I was very careful because I didn't, when I was in Nigeria, I hated the fact that people in the diaspora was always speaking for us. Um, because in a way it became so performative and people didn't really know what, what, what was happening. And I think there's something about survival. It's always very quick. Um, you might be in Nigeria two years now from like a go and the way queer people survive has changed in that two years into something else. And so sometimes I'm always very careful in speaking so it doesn't feel like I'm speaking to the past when things have moved on. So for example, I cannot stand here and say, oh, um, queer people in Nigeria are like voiceless. When there's someone like Matthew Blaze um, who, ha who has been doing so much um, even during the NSAS um, protests, that the fact that they were on the streets um, chanting about queer lives was something so powerful to even see. It was something in, five years ago, I don't think we could like imagine that moment, right? And and it's, it's constantly changing. Um, and so what I've been able to do, it's to step back and allow people who, whose voice are more urgent than mine speak. Um, I also realize I'm in a place of privilege. And, and so the idea of what danger means have changed for me. Um, and I think there are people who understand that concept as it relates to being in being Nigeria. And I, and I sometimes listen to them. Um, so for example, um, like during the NSAS, I had a lot of people say, oh, write an article and all that stuff. And so what I've been able to do is actually, if it's $3,000, for example, recommend someone back home who's queer and who's doing the work and who that money um, means more resources to either speak out or to just, you know, given the fact that a lot of openly queer people struggle for jobs. Yeah. So in, in a way, that's what I've been, been able to do. Um, I also link people to organizations. Um, there are a lot of people who want to reach out and help but don't know how. I'm also always trying to cut off the NGOs um, because I really do hate NGOs. Um, not because I don't think they're not, they're not doing a good work because I had a very I had a very bad time with them. Think apart from tears, a lot of the NGOs, um, queer NGOs, I, I had a, an encounter with in Nigeria were just using me to get money. Um, and I was also very privileged because I, I think I've, I've won the Brunel by then. I could easily write to Kwame or Chris or Bernardine or, or anybody for help in a way I know a lot of queer folks in Nigeria cannot. And so I'm always thinking of ways of bypassing the NGOs and, and working with people directly. Um, I also think that the activism space in Nigeria is very middle class. Um, so I'm always thinking about people who are doing the real work on the grassroots, like people who if if they have hundred dollars can actually reach people who need that hundred dollars not um holding events that no one cares about like no one in nigeria cares about what's the first pride parade is you know people want resources and not 
And so I'm, I'm always thinking about that instead of the aesthetic of what it means to be queer. Yeah, so, um, and I don't, I don't know if I can offer anything, but I think for me, my, my engagement keeps changing every single day. Um, I look at what people are doing and I react based on that. Um, and so recently I've been, when I speak about Quinn, it's, it has been something that's very personal to me, um, given the fact that I also know that I'm a very, very masculine presenting bisexual man, which is very different from someone who's trans in Nigeria or someone who's very effeminate um, in Nigeria. You know, it also has to do also do with, with literature. I think before we started, I was telling, talking to Krishna about the fact that I was very surprised I won the Nigerian prize. Um, and also it's not far-fetched. My own, the way I present myself is also a way, also helped because I don't, I don't think, for example, um, if I was Marty Blaze, someone would care at all for that. You know, so I, I think I'm always, I'm always thinking and rethinking these things and um, thinking about ways in which when I can step in, but also when my absence can also help and allow people to um, do what they have to do. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my own personal philosophy of how I do things. I think some people want to be very direct um, and if it works, I want to like say, oh, I'm speaking for queer people, um, queer Nigerians in the US. And if it works in, in, in helping, um, that's fine. But when I was in Nigeria, I was very, very, um, I was very, very underprivileged. Um, and so I didn't care about someone going to Pride Week in New York to say we are queer, we are here. It didn't do anything for me. Um, I also didn't care about someone going to the UN to make a speech. It didn't really do anything for me. I didn't see the effect. So I'm always very careful um, about, about what it meant, what it means for me. Because I, I think also I think about these things very, I think about it to a point where it almost feels as if I'm inflicting a wound on myself. And so I'm always very careful to say, um, I'm always very careful how, how when the work I'm doing stop being activism and start becoming something that I used in also moving through spaces and becoming a known name. What does it mean for the work in Nigeria itself? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think about it. My head is like a mess when I start talking about this thing. So yeah, those are, those are, those are ways in which I, I keep asking myself questions and depending on the answers, I don't know it all, but depending on where I am at that particular moment determines what I, what I try to do. Thank you, Romeo, for sharing that very frank answer. Um, we're um, close to finishing our session, and we will do so. But Kwame Dawes, do you have any last thoughts or comments? Um, well, I would just, I mean, first of all, thank you, Romeo, for the, the, the honesty. Um, uh, of your the way that you 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 responded to all these questions and of course the, what emerges in your in your own writing and in your work, um, I I am just affirming for you that um, the that your work is your work and the life that you're building around your work um, is valuable and and I think not just valuable but I think it's making a difference for many writers um, uh, especially writers out of Africa. Um, and and I think to me this is this is massively important because I think it it does two things. I think one it it allows for possibility and and that to me is something that can be stifled. Um, but at the same time, I think that you are amongst you know as you, you I I appreciate that you welcome being part of a crowd that is moving. Um, and and some people don't like that thought, but I think your your idea of thinking community and thinking the individual in community strikes me as as one of the beautiful things that 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 has great value. Um, so so those those are, those are my thoughts. I I just I just wanted to um, to 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 affirm that and to say that it's been it's been a tremendous honor to be working with you. Um, which at this stage is your choice. <laughs> I'll be, I'll, that's, I'll, that's why I appreciate it so much. I'll be with you until you kick me out. 
How do, you, how do you tell me that I have to go to the streets? I know. I tried. I tried. I said, go. These people want to. He says, no, I'll stay. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> so that's okay. No, no. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful work. And this has been fantastic to hear everybody sort of talking about um, these, these topics. So, yeah. Yes, thank you both. And thank you, everyone, for a very inspiring session. Yeah. Thank you for coming and thank you, Krishna.